uh, for today we have uh, uh, we have mainly three uh, different topics. Number one, I'm going to mention about the matrix pen. Uh, uh, although you guys don't we still don't have a, the, the matrix holder, just like a big update. We had a meeting yesterday uh, with the class president, the class, uh, the class president. So uh, I talked about Dr. Fadul this morning, and he decided that the, the department will purchase the matrix holders. Okay. It's not a gift for you, so you can borrow the holders until the end of the semester. And these holders have to be returned by the end of the, this course here. And then once you go to clinic, they will be available for you for 30 and 40 years. Okay? So they already ordered the holders. It should be here by tomorrow. Unfortunately for today, we still don't have the holders to be used. It's okay. We're going to move forward with prepping. That's uh, I'm going to show you this uh, lecture uh, how to handle the matrix pen, but it's still uh, only a demo how to use the matrix holder and the matrix pen in lab. And that's a probably is uh, if not next week, the following week. Okay? Uh, we do have the competency one fast approaching. I'm going to change the schedule a little bit based on this issue. So I'm going to uh, upload an updated schedule for you, hopefully by today or uh, uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, so then uh, my, my intention is to postpone the competency one a little bit, so then you have enough time to practice it before coming for an exam. Okay? But the situation is fixed. Okay? We're going to get, you know, the, somehow someone removed the holder from the list, we don't know who, uh, but the idea that we're going to fix that yes. So anyhow, uh, the lecture here, we're going to talk about the matrix band a little bit, how to use it, how to place it. I'm going to quickly show you a video. Uh, then I'm going to jump into the glass to restoration per se, how to remove decay, uh, although we don't have decay uh, in the lab. And then finally, I'm going to just like touch base a little bit with you with uh, etching and bonding, although this is not the main topic for this, uh, for this year. We're going to learn everything about our stuff next year. I don't have to go super, super deep on that aspect. I have to use two computers because my Mac is not working. So the Toffelmeyer matrix system. Okay. Um, before you jump into the Toffelmeyer per se, let me just talk about the wedges. Wedges are so important. And don't think when I talk about the matrix system, the holder, the matrix, the boomerang, the shape, wedges are so important. Not only doing the placement of the matrix, but also before, as I mentioned to you. You're doing a class two, uh, immediately up after the patient is, uh, is frozen, is anesthetized, you have to put a wedge in order to break this. I have seen some preps in the lab, and some students are already doing some damage on the adjacent tube. So be careful with that. Once the patient is anesthetized, put a wedge, the wedge is going to create some space for you, avoid damage on the adjacent tooth. You can also visualize better the area they're working, and it's also going to create some space for the sectional matrix that you guys have it from the ultra vent to protect the adjacent. Uh, just to highlight this, uh, this white is going to be made of wood. That's the one you have in the pictures here, uh, or plastic. Usually, wood is the one that is, is, is the choice for a magma restoration. They're the cheapest option, and they are color cool. Sometimes uh, you see different colors from different brands, uh, so pick it up with the one that is matching the color uh, that's going to fit this space for you. Uh, the acrylic ones, they're specifically made for composite restoration. Why? Because sometimes after you remove the matrix system, you still keep the wedge in place. You can like here again a composite class 2, and the acrylic uh, wedge is going to reflect that light and perhaps provide more hearing for the composite material in those very deep areas that you cannot see. You can customize a wedge. Uh, although they come in different sizes and shapes and different colors, you can also make it more narrow or, or they can fit more narrow spaces if necessary. Okay? This is important for you to remember. In all posterior class 2 restoration, regardless if you're doing a mock or composite, you must use a wedge. This is not optional. And also it's not optional during competence. Because if you're doing a competence with me and you forgot about the wedge, you're busted. That's it. You fail the whole competence. 
If you're doing a board exam and you forgot about the wedge, that's it. You feel the whole board exam. It's so important to place a wedge because the whole adaptation of the class to box is depending on the wedge. Don't miss that important point. Uh, also, putting wedges, you see in clinical uh, situation that eventually some damage is expected for the soft tissue. So it's not hard to see some soft tissue start bleeding, particularly if the patient has some sort of periodontal condition. Although patients with periodontal condition should never have like a brand new restoration in place, right? They should treat the barrier first and then come for restoration. But you're going to see some bleeding eventually because the damage will be present. Don't worry about that in a few uh, days that the soft tissue is going back to normal. And this is extremely important and huge impact on the day of restoration if it is placed. So although I tell you you must use it, but you must use it properly. Because if you don't place properly, you see that is a gap in between the matrix band and the restore and the tooth. So then the restorative material goes in between that gap. As a result, we have a, a kind of like overhang. Areas. It's, it's, it's very common actually to see those overhangs when I take x rays with students and senior and junior years here. And usually come the question like, well, what happens? So like, oh, because of the wedge. So they placed the matrix panel, but they forgot to check if the wedge was properly placed or not. Be careful with that, okay? Uh, here, I just want to show you that this is the right place to the wedge. It's, uh, it's actually it's below the gingival cable surface margin, it's touching the matrix band, and it's, it's actually putting some pressure on the matrix band towards the tube. As a result, we don't have any space in the gap between matrix and tube. The best way to check if the wedge is effective or not is by using an exploder, a sharp brand new one that you have in your kit. So I, I will show you in the video, but you have to touch that small little cable surface margin and see if there is a space. Still, there is a space, we place the wedge, grab a, a bigger one. Really, you need to put a lot of pressure there because keep in mind that you are condensing amalgam in the proximal box and you're putting certain pressure on that amalgam uh, material. If you don't have a wedge in place, that is going to create an overhang. Worst case scenario. Uh, again, you can prevent your teeth for class two preparation, not only doing the matrix. Uh, placement. Sometimes if you know we have a huge space in between teeth, you can also use two wedges as long as they are still in the same horizontal level. I don't want to wedge on top of each other. Why? Because eventually one of them is going to deform the matrix band. If you pay attention in these uh, two lower pictures here, this is a common scenario that uh, uh, you know a patient was having a class two and suddenly when we place a wedge, the wedge is in the proper place and suddenly you're deforming the matrix band. As a result, you're going to place some algma there and that algma is going to follow that anatomy. That's wrong. Imagine if you had a class two done here, once you remove everything that is like this concave area from that uh, proximal box. That can work as a full trap barrier. Don't do that. Uh, in order to customize wedges, uh, we suggest you be careful using a blade, scalpel, whatever you have in hands. Or uh, I think you guys have that in your kit, those uh, little sand discs, it can be a soft flex, it can be, uh, I think you have in your, in your fixed uh, kit, right? With the mandrel with the, the straight hand piece. So you can just uh, start trimming a little bit the wedges and they can fit in some very narrow places. Something important to also to remember is that usually it's easier to put the wedges from lingual to facial. The only exception is between first and second upper molars because uh, the facial embrasure is bigger, so we can put from facial to lingual. That's the only exception. But everything else, uh, in any, any other place, uh, usually from lingual to facial. Uh, question for you when I mentioned about the two wedges, they're not supposed to be on top of each other. Can it be one from lingual to facial and the other one from facial to lingual? Yes, if you have room, there's a diastema there, that's how we call it, a big space in between teeth. Yes. Again, as long as they're not going on top of each other, you're fine because you have room for that. The only rule I'm telling you is that it's easier in a normal situation to put a wedge from lingual to facial. In a normal patient, a normal uh, occlusion uh, 
scenario. So wedges in place. I'm sorry, the PowerPoint is messing up with my keynote's presentation. I need to do it. It's kind of really crazy. Uh, Watch is in place. I have my matrix plan in place. The next step, guys, is also super important: is to burnish that matrix plan. What is the reason to burnish the matrix plan? It's just to the right counter for the matrix plan. So when I condense the infinity in class two, I have the right counter for my class two. You see that for composite, we are actually using the prefab matrix systems, uh, the Garrison or the Paladin, and they have a concave shape. It's, it's, a, it's a pre form. You don't have to burnish anything. Why? Because this group there, you're actually hacking the composite into the gap. You're not condensing the composite. You're only condensing amalgam. Does that make sense? Amalgam, you, you have to be really strong. You put a lot of stress there. You're condensing really strong to avoid porosity or open margins or gaps. Composite is just packing layers. It's so gentle. That's why the, the matrix system for composite is slightly different, right? Uh, we can use this spoon excavator or you can also use the burnisher. I like the burnisher better because it's easier to fit in between uh, the space there. So I don't have a, and this is like a five seconds maneuver. Okay? So it won't take too long. Uh, the holder, you notice that it's a little slot called the fork also the holder. And that slot or fork is always uh, facing gingerly. Never uh, uh, occlusally, because otherwise the matrix then won't be properly in place. So this is something you pay attention and be careful with that and with numbers, all right? By the way, this lecture was just uploaded a second ago uh, on, uh, on Canvas. So you can, you can download the PDF there, so if you're making notes. So far, so good here? Are you guys okay? Any questions? No. So this is the holder with the matrix in position. So we have this, uh, we call like a holding vice, this area here that the matrix will be folded by this uh, big screw here. Uh, the matrix band can be facing uh, forward or straight or can also be facing left or right based on the position that you're placing on the type of down or the patient's mouth. So that's the demo that we're going to do probably in a few weeks when you have the holder. And uh, you have to pay attention to that because uh, it helps a lot to be facing the right position. Now, I have to switch to my Mac and the Solstice. a big ball burnisher. I don't know if you guys have that one here. Yes. If not, that's okay. You still have the, the little one. I like to burnish my, my boomerang matrix system. It makes like a better, you know, curvature and it's easier to place on the holder. All right. And also eventually it's going to help on the counter of the tube. So this is the holder that you're going to receive uh, in a few days. We have this smaller uh, neural like that, that you, you have to twist it in order to keep you know, the, the matrix on the little vise there. And the big knot that when you turn it, when you twist it, you're going to move the matrix system uh, uh, back and forth. So depending on the size of the tooth you're working, you have to rotate the big guy there in order to change the diameter. Okay? So the large knot controls the large vise moving up, up, back and forth. Yeah, and we're going to show that in a demo, uh, but I just want to show you in the video here for you to have an idea. So 
you're not going to adapt the matrix system uh, into the holder. And you notice that once you flip and you hold it together, the matrix band, this is the top of the wire matrix band, has this boomerang shape. Uh, suddenly you have a smaller diameter and a bigger diameter. Smaller is always facing digital. Always. Don't put it upside down. Because that's the right counter of the two that we're working, right? Especially by cuspids, you have the emergence profile. So a smaller area is always facing digital. Is that okay? So far so good? Good. So we're going to place you know, the matrix band inside the holder. Very easy and simple process. That's the slot that I was talking about. You see, it looks like a little fork. That fork is always facing gingerly, never occlusively. It's actually easier if it's facing gingerly because once you put in place, it's putting pressure and helping you to adjust towards the, the cervical area on the tooth. So putting the matrix in between that little slot on the vise, Gonna now turn this small little nut on the back of the matrix holder. And that's gonna keep the matrix in position. There we go. When you do that in lab or in clinic, make sure that the matrix is super stable, it's not moving at all. Okay, the last thing I want for you to do is start you know, packing and, and doing an awkward situation, uh, on the HTML, and suddenly the matrix holder is going to be dislodged from the matrix system. That's a mess. Because eventually the contact is going to be open, or it might destroy the, the proximal marginal reach. That's a mess. So everything must be tight, must be stable before you place it in the patient's mouth. And this, this is actually something that your system can do for you beforehand. You don't have to do that during the procedure. Currently, also, we have in the market something that's called the uh, uh, disposable matrix systems, right? And that's the, the, the one we're actually using clinic now. So we're no longer using this system. Although we're using it in school, you never know the place you're going to be working after you finish graduation, right? So you might go to, I don't know, an office outside that is still using the system here, which is pretty old. But you have to learn how to use this one. But outside, you also have the option to use a disposable one. Just not actually. All right, let me just uh, move forward a little bit. This is how to place the holder in place. And uh, I just want to show you how to put the matrix system on the type of mount. So you see, I can move to left or right, and I'm going to place on the tooth depending on the location of my restoration. As I mentioned to you before, you have to use a finishing uh, a strip or a finishing sand uh, strip to make sure the contacts are, are you know, uh, making you uh, capable of putting the matrix system. Also, you see why it's important sometimes in lab, you're also asking you to open the contact, open the contact. It's like, well, why is it important to open the contact? That's actually one of the reasons. If you don't have open contact on the facial, lingual, and the gingival walls, you cannot fit the matrix there. So you need to open and make sure that at least the tip of your explorer can fit in between the tooth you're prepping and the adjacent tooth. We didn't have enough room to place the major system. Whatever you do here, that is a reason for it. Big trust us. We're not lying. Putting the matrix in position. So again, I'm, I'm going to adjust the circumference on the matrix. I'm going to twist the big nut on the back of the matrix holder. But you see that I still have a gap in between the matrix and the tube. There we go. That, that's the gap right there. See it? Let me go back a little bit. You see what happened when I put a wedge? Let's, let's do a replay. You see this gap right here? Pay attention right here. It is open. If you don't put a wedge and start condensing the magma, that amount of is going to go to the, the uh, subgenual area. See the wedge coming from Lingo? Beautiful. I'm just going to close that space. And you have to put a lot of pressure to make sure the wedge is stable. Uh, I mean, don't be gentle at this time here. Be brutal. Because I want my stable, my stabilization, I want my matrix system holding together, then I can properly start condensing my model. So 
So we're going to burnish the matrix system. This is my little ball burnish. It looks like a little uh, hammer. And now it's burnishing against the opposing or the adjacent. See? A few seconds. That's it. That's all I need. By doing this, I'm going to form the matrix system and it's going to copy the surface on the adjacent side. And this is so important. I don't want to see you guys do reservations with no light contact or loose contact. Because if you do that, we are going to ask you to replace the whole restoration. Worst case scenario in clinic is that you dismiss a patient if you open contact, the next day patients call and say, you know what, I cannot even have you know, a decent view because food is getting trapped in there. You have you left just open contact. By just burnish that matrix in seconds, you fix that small little bitch. Now, you see the matrix well adapted to the cervical cable surface marker right here? Don't trust from the visual. Test it. What is the best way to test the area? It's by using an exploder. I hope the exploder uh, the checking point. What I'm doing now is just uh, using an exploder with a sharp end and just put it there, right on the cable surface there. So if the matrix it looks visually okay, but you still have not a lot of pressure coming from the wedge, the exploder is going to fit in between the matrix and the tooth. That's a problem. You replace the wedge. Once you're done, restoration is beautiful. You just have a most amazing restoration. What is the best way to remove matrix? Remember, this is a brand new model. Be gentle now. Stop being brutal and go back to the gentle mode. Okay? So the best thing that we can do is be gentle removing the matrix cyst in a way that you're not going to fracture the marginal bridges. This is the top number one issue of students not paying attention to this very important stuff. How are we going to do that? Basically, just going to uh, disassemble the whole thing and you're going to remove the holder but leave the matrix in place. Never, ever, ever pull the matrix system from neutral to occlusal. Because by doing that, you're actually asking for the matrix band to break your marginal reach. And then comes the question, what should I do if I break the marginal reach? What do you think? This is the patient? No, we have to throw the whole thing out. Start from the beginning again. Composite is different because you're doing like hearing, right? That's different. I'm always so sensitive once it's done. And but by the way, you guys are using the, the, the slow set um, right? It takes like 156 years. Yes. And then you go to clinic on the third year, and it takes about six seconds to get set. <laughs> right? Am I right? I mean, seriously, it takes a few seconds. Right? Yeah. There is no transition, okay? I don't know every time I show a video in a lecture, it comes to those stupid suggestions for YouTube. <laughs> Guys, I don't watch American Got Talent or whatever. <laughs> this is so ridiculous. <laughs> okay? I don't like this. <laughs> Sorry for the PowerPoint. So let's see what happens if you don't pay attention to my life. Start doing things on your own. I start collecting beautiful pictures from you. Like these two clinic okay. Look at that. How beautiful is it? How flat is this person on there? Burnishing? What is that? I don't know if you can see this picture here, but this is actually the finishing line. This is the mark. Right? So what is happening here? Huge overhang. Beautiful matrix system. We do have probably a contact there, but the dentist completely forgot to put it on a simple wedge. The thing is, that sometimes we look at a picture like this and we laugh and like, this is ridiculous, but we don't see like the, you know, the next uh, phases of this. This area eventually is going to work as a food trap area. 
Uh, you might create a periodontal issue by having uh, pockets, and these pockets eventually can be turning into a severe periodontal issue, and then suddenly the patient comes back to the office like five years later, and there is no more bone right here. I have seen cases with patients with endoperio lesion because of class tumor solution. That is a serious okay? What you're looking for is the perfect adaptation once you take a final x-ray. By the way, I always suggest my kids, my students to take final x-rays, as long as the patient is okay with that. Particularly if I'm doing a, a final simulation or something, everything that involves the proximal box, no matter what, I'm taking a final x-ray. You know, it, it won't hurt. I mean, the radiation level is ridiculous low. And how much are you going to charge a patient for an x-ray, Dr. Yeah. President? $7? Mm -hmm. No, no, you charge for the post -time. So I think that is a fee, but I think the fee is about 7 bucks, right? So, yeah, most people don't even charge. You know, it, it is part of the deal because it's actually quality control. You're actually showing patients that you care about the quality of your service, and you can show this to the patients. You know what? I'm using this as a market. This is important. So as long as the patient know, uh, is happy and you have a perfect application, there you go. You, you have a successful case. Questions about matrix system? No. Have you guys ever used any matrix system in the first year? Okay, good. Uh, let's continue with the class two clinical sequence. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen because I have uh, some different slides here, so hopefully PowerPoint won't mess it up. <laughs> Alright, so although we are working plastic teeth and these plastic teeth, they don't have anything going on, don't have decay, I'm not replacing you know, restoration. So I'm just going to slowly you know, bring back steps that have been doing. And this is actually it was a steel plastic tooth, but with some decay. Every time you see a tooth like this, lots of decay, and you're pressing a class 2, you have to always to keep in mind the sequence, the steps that you're going through. Uh, in clinic, it's important that the number one step before you start doing an aesthetic elevation is to ask the patient to bite down with a piece of articulating paper. Why is that important? It's because when you're carving that amalgam or placing the positive crystal anatomy, you kind of have an idea about the patient's occlusion. Sometimes when I see a tooth that has a very deep restoration or old restoration of decay that I might have to remove and replace for a new one, or I know that this, based on the x-ray, this is going to be a large restoration. This step here is helping me to memorize what I have in terms of occlusal contacts. Sometimes I even put like a piece of wax on the occlusal uh, area of the tooth and ask the patient to bite down. When the patient opens the mouth, I can see areas that you know the, the, the wax is going to be deeper uh, indented by the occlusal tooth. And those areas are going to memorize, and by the time I'm carving, I'm going to go deeper in those areas. Why I'm doing this? You see in clinic that once you're done the whole procedure, you're tired, your eyes are not working well, right? It's like very class two sometimes it's challenging. But because you memorize those areas, you kind of like, you know, took advantage of that, ended up, you know, shaving down a little bit beforehand. Now the patient is biting down for the final checkup, the occlusion is perfect. What happens if you don't do that is that the patient is going to bite down slowly because it's a brand new amalgam, my fracture, and, and suddenly not even the other side is touching because it's so high. What you have to do now is start carving again, start shaving down. Remember, in clinic, amalgam is going to set in seconds. You have to be careful. Suddenly, amalgam is hard. If the carver is not working, you have to switch for a burn. That time that you're losing is actually costing you money. Again, the idea of the goal is to start and finish a procedure in a 30 minutes time slot. Doing this whole thing here in 30 minutes. You don't do that in 30 minutes if you don't have the steps beforehand already in your mind. And this is a very important one. Take advantage of the articulating paper and memorize the patient's occlusion before you even start drilling the tube. If you want to do that in the lab just to memorize this step, do it. I don't mind at all. You guys have articulated papers, right? Using things. Take the type of those to you know, apply together, and they have you know, some sort of occlusal uh, check mark points. 
that patient is ready, I'm going to put my isolation for that, of course, patient is going to be anesthetized. Remember, by putting the clamp in the isolation, patient must be fully anesthetized, otherwise this is going to occur. But look how beautiful it is. Now I have the isolation place. I have this contrast that I mentioned to you last week from the tooth with the rubber dam. I can better see areas because now I don't have saliva, I don't have more bleeding. When you put the light on the tooth, it's going to reflect beautifully in all those areas. And even by using loops, you can see whatever you want. What is the first step uh, in order to uh, start drilling a class two here? Don't grab the high speed handpiece of the 245 and the 1156. That's nuts. You have to move the gate. Here, in the lab downstairs, we don't have the gate, don't worry. Go for the 1156 and the 245. But in clinic, this is the very first step. Number one, you're gonna switch for a big round bird, slow speed. When I say slow speed, is about 30, 35,000 RPM max. Still with water cooling, but I'm going to remove the gate. I'm also going to remove a supporting handle. This is actually called the convenience form. I'm exposing the area, I'm removing the gate. By doing that, this is actually a pretty close simulation of clinic. You see that, you know, debris flying all over the place. It's actually decay. It's a, it's a, it's a mix of organic and inorganic, uh, you know, substract with bacteria. I call it Parmesan cheese. I love the Parmesan cheese taste because it's, I can easily visualize. You know, every time I have class on Sunday, I know why. That looks like the case. Like, that's disgusting. <laughs> so, every time you have the Parmesan cheese, it uses the slow speed herb. You know, the, the, the thing is, once you start getting deeper into the cavity, be careful with birds and your rotor instruments. What is the best idea? Switch for the hand instruments, spool excavator. If you notice on the x-ray, and by the way, everything that I'm doing here, that's simulated, this is a real clinical case. At the same time, I have a huge PA right in front of me. Because if this is a real patient, I'm removing that amount of PA, number one. That tooth previously, I already did something called the Vitalis test. I was making sure the tooth is vital, is responding. I don't need to look around. Number two, that x-ray is right for me all the time. Because I want to see exactly how far I am from the pulp. If you're eventually going to have a pulp exposure, well, isolation is already in place, at least this tooth is protected. There is a chance that I can do a proper move now. Not me, but I refer to my events. Number two, if I'm going super deep, I don't want to contaminate the cat. The last thing I want is to mix and put in the equation here, contamination comes from the saliva. So isolation is extremely important. So a spoon excavator is going to help you remove the parmesan cheese slowly if you're getting to more you know, deeper areas. If you start seeing the dentist changing colors, it's going to more a pinkish dentin. Be ready. You might have exposure. Sometimes exposure means that you no longer have just like a bleeding. Have you guys seen like a exposure in a bowl? I'm bring the problem here, so I'm gonna show that. Sometimes you can see like light blood coming from the tooth, and that's a huge exposure. But sometimes see, that is a microscopic exposure. That those are you, you don't see it. He had exposure, but I had no idea. And he said, you know what, I'm gonna restore the tooth anyways. The tooth is gonna survive if you want. The nature of that patient might need a root canal. Anyhow, going back here, the goal is to remove the cave. And that dentin is sound, it's hard, it makes a noise. Have you hear like the kind of noise and use a spoon excavator? Not yet, because we haven't worked with your natural teeth. That's why you're having a lab session next week. By the way, don't forget to bring in the natural teeth. We're going to be removing decay. And I want you guys to learn that precious sound that is from the spoon excavator. Showing a hard dentin, it's a, a carries free dentin. That's the most amazing sound when you're dealing with a case like this. Right up there. It's a sound too. I did my job. And it's like to do the same thing on both ends to remove all those cases. 
So next week, hopefully, we're going to have experience using this Buddhist cathedral and, and listening to that sound. That's so important. <laughs> Once you listen to that sound, you hear that sound, and the dentist is hard, is no longer stain or anything, that's a, that's a healthy dentist. You get it's pinkish or it's changing colors, that means they're probably way super close to the function. We do also have a lecture coming up in a few weeks. Uh, uh, Dr. Risante is going to do the lecture talking about liners and bases. Okay? So uh, he's going to teach you uh, what to do when you have like a deep uh, uh, denting exposure or, or a deep cavity like this. We have to use some medication inside the tooth before placing the resolution. All right, that's coming up in a few weeks. So again, the, the sectional matrix is in place. I have my wedge. This is the pre-wedging maneuver in order to create space. I'm going to continue removing my decay using my round bur. You see uh, that I'm tilting the round bur 45 degrees, going forward the proximal area there. Guys, it's still slow speed and removing decay. I'm just showing the real life. Okay? Removing decay is slow speed, and suddenly, once this is done, I'm going to uh, uh, move forward and switch for a high speed work. There we go. Ideal margins uh, should be placed above the CJ. See how beautiful the margin is right here? That means I still have a step between the cable surface margin and the rubber dam on the cervical area. We're also going to respect the principle for cavity preparation, including convenience, form, retention, and resistance. Right? I'll do exactly the same thing on the other side. And this is the final part. This is a carous free tooth. Denting is hard. I no longer have any decay left on the nano and denting. Uh, by the way, clinical tip for you. When you're doing a case like this, large decay, sometimes we pay too much attention on the denting. But sometimes we also forget to check the denting in nano junction. In those areas, there are number one areas for you to left on the decay. So always look for a staining interface between nano and denting. I'll repeat that. Sometimes we are too focused on the denting. We also have to pay attention on enamels, particularly on the enamel denting junction. That's the number one area that you guys are going to uh, left some decay. And that decay is going to lead this tooth to a recurring decay of a bunch of problems that the patient, eventually the patient have to replace them. See how beautiful it is? I have a very flat gingival floor. I have a decent, smooth, Gingival cable surface margin. What is the retention form here? When you look at you through the occlusive view, like the way I'm looking right now, I cannot see the internal light angles besides the axial cobalt light angle. That means that this tooth has what? Conversion on the facial and lingual walls. If you do exactly the same thing on your type one, but you still see an internal light angle, means what? Have Go back. Last week I saw a bunch of divergent, uh, particularly in the proximal boxes. Watch out, put the mirror if you want to remove here in the lab, just for training purposes, for these uh, first you know, sessions. Remove the type of and look in your hand, that's fine. But keep practicing using a mirror in a way that you can see this tooth in that particular angle. Promise? No more divergent. Always convergent. Go home today, say that virgin. Convergent. Convergent. Alright? Questions so far? No? Once this is done, again, uh, let's say this is a case for deep carries, so eventually you might have to use a liner or a base or both. Dr. Vicente is going to give you a lecture about that. Uh, but let's say that the, the liner base is already placed, the tube is ready to be restored. The next step is to do uh, what we call the hybrid layer formation. We're going to prepare this tube to, re to receive an adhesive layer. Guys, back in the day when I was in NATO school, a long time ago, actually it was more than 20 years ago, 
in the IO. We didn't have any adhesives to be used with a mop. At that time, we used to put like a something called like a varnish. And the, the idea was a mix of epoxy resin with some uh, solvent. And, and the goal for that product was to seal the dentin tubes. And then you put a mop on top, and then that's it. Most of the dentists never use the varnish, right, Dr. J? Do you use varnish? Well, what, what they, they used to teach you that, but I don't know, my question is, do you think people outside are using varnish a lot? By the way, if you, if you have a dentist, a parent, or a relative in your family, they probably have some varnish left in the dental office. That smell, for me, smells like a dentist. That's a dental office smell, right? This is the best smell we can have in a dental office. Because it talks the resin, right? The solvent. Well, it has eugenol inside. Yeah, but uh, that, that is some, some resin uh, percentage. There. You are absolutely right. That's the eugenol. Yes. And I love that smell. Every time I have a chance, it's like. Yeah? Yeah. That's a good story. So what happened over the years is that uh, the technology came in and the industries, they started working in something called adhesive. They, uh, you guys never, never exposed to the, the age of adhesion. Eventually, uh, everything nowadays in terms of restorative dentistry is based on that. The goal, the ultimate goal in dentistry, for at least for us, the restorative people is to seal the dentistry. So they switched the varnish, uh, the modern varnish, for something called adhesive. And actually, that's the same procedure you guys have been doing for the SAP, of course, uh, probably uh, in the you know, other preclinical course, and all over your life, you know, uh, between uh, your clinical years. Uh, any cons have you guys ever used phosphoric acid before? But not adhesives, right? <laughs> you just etch the tooth and you apply some sealants. Am I correct? What was the experience? You know who created that, that idea? It was a guy in 1955, his name was Michael Bonapore, and he is the father of the adhesion age. Uh, basically, Bonapore was not, 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 not only a dentist, right? He was also an engineer. So he developed that idea based on painting uh, techniques that you used to see like people painting boats and things like that. And he noticed that these guys were using some sort of acid or a primer before applying the painting material. So he said, you know what? What happens if you do exactly the same thing with you? And he started testing different types of acids and, and, and somehow he came up with the idea of using phosphoric acid, which is a very weak acid, but actually was really a perfect pattern to use with sealant. So this article from 1955 was specifically talking about sealant and how to use phosphoric acid. Going back here, uh, when you finish a class two um, in lab or in the clinic, so we have to create the hybrid layer. We have to seal all the dentin tubes. First step is to use the phosphoric acid, 37%. 30 seconds on enamel, 15 seconds on dentin. This is universal. Okay? Uh, some manufacturer companies might suggest a different time, but universal rule is 15 seconds dentin, 30 seconds enamel. Repeat after me. 15 seconds denting. 30 seconds in amp. Again. 15 seconds denting. 30 seconds in amp. Don't do it the other way around. If 30 seconds denting might create a lot of sensitivity. You ask the patient to go through it now. Anyhow, uh, when you're applying the phosphoric acid, the goal is also to protect the adjacent tooth from this acid. I just want to add my cavity. I don't want to etch anything else. And this etching procedure is actually is going to create some protection for the adhesive that eventually going to be placed there. Do you see a different mylar, a different matrix system here? This plastic matrix system. This is called the mylar strip. Uh, you guys are going to use that a lot with Dr. Asaf for class 3, 5, uh, it's not 5, class 3 and class 4. So that's a plastic, really flexible paper uh, system. Don't use that to restore a model. Because if you do that, I might have a heart attack. That's a no-no. That's not acceptable. 
So put it aside once you do the etching and bonding. Okay? Do not just work with that matrix system. Then you're gonna rinse and dry the tooth, and you're gonna see that chalky appearance on enamel. That's actually the enamel showing that it was etched. So there's some mineral that it was removed from that enamel. Now the tooth is ready to receive the adhesive player. We're not going to use the adhesive here with BPL2, but we do gonna use this a lot in Dr. Sass course. So I'm just gonna introduce you to the technique. I don't want you to think that for a mouth restoration, we don't do any hybrid layer formation. Yes, we do use adhesive for a mouth. Scientifically speaking, that's the best option. So this is called a micro brush. It's carrying the adhesive. I'm applying the tube. Can you see the chalk appears? It's gone. Now I have this glossy, brilliant surface uh, appearance. So the adhesive is actually penetrating into all the dentin tubules and also covering all the enamel. Uh, crystals there, and after this is done, we are going to light here. So usually the wavelength for the light is about 407 nanometers, which is the blue light. That's why you see the blue lights that the dentists are using. Did you know that? Yeah. Good. Here's our hero, Dr. Michael G. He was the chair of the Department of Dental Materials uh, in Rochester, and this is the art. <coughs> Simple method of using the adhesion, really filling materials for sealants uh, in which you may have. Just for you to memorize better my idea here. This is what happens when you are actually etching enamel. Okay, this is the enamel surface. By the way, if you don't remember, enamel is composed by 95% of hydroxyapatite. A very, very uh, low percentage of uh, organic phase, 1% more or less, and about 4% of water. We have a lot of mineral only that. It's so much easier to add enamel when you use the phosphoric acid. So if I apply my acid here, usually, by the way, the phosphoric acid is blue, okay? so they're kind of like color code. Let's remove a layer of no, enamel and see what happens when I apply it for it. Yes. The, the blue gel comes on top of enamel. Um, clinically speaking, I like to clean my enamel surface with pumice and water, so this blue gel actually penetrates better, create a better etching surface for me. And the idea is to remove some mineral on there. So once you remove it, you're gonna rinse the area. And you're gonna over dry enamel, we over dry, remove all the water. Denting, we try to keep denting with some, some water, some moisture. Okay? Just uh, in terms of information, basically we have three types of enamel etching patterns. The first one, you're going to etch mostly uh, the, the periphery, uh, the core actually, the crystals. The pattern number two, we're gonna etch the periphery of the crystals. And the pattern number three, is actually a mix of the code. <laughs> Dr. Asaf is going to go over this topic. We don't have to go deeper into this. So, dancing is a little bit different because of the organic phase, they have a, a way higher percentage in there. So, we still have about 70% of hydroxyapatite, so it's a pretty decent percentage. But, in terms of water and organic phase, basically collagen type of one fibers, we have the remaining 30%. So, and dentin is actually different because it's a living tissue. We have extensions coming from the bulk chamber into the dentin. But let's put the same you know, situation, put the phosphoric acid on top of my dentin, and let's see what happens. Uh, Number one, in dentin, actually, uh, we have a different uh, number of dentin tubes. So the closer you are to the, the, to, to the bulk chamber, the higher is the number of dentin tubes. That's why I was mentioning to you, be careful with deep decay cavities. Because not only there is a chance for it to expose the bulk, but also the chance for sensitivity. You have way more dentin tubules, and actually these dentin tubules are actually bigger in terms of height. So applying the, this is actually the hybrid layer, or I'm sorry, the smear layer. 
that's a mix of you know, uh, organic, inorganic, and water, and oils, and a bunch of stuff that is a debris that is left in the dentin surface. So when you apply the phosphoric acid on the dentin, you're actually removing that uh, smear layer over the dentin. And not only that, you're also going to remove minerals from the dentin tubules. But because the percentage of organic is so high, eventually you're going to expose some collagen fibers. And these are the fibers that you can see on the video right here. And I said before that in you have to overdry because you get better adhesion. For dentin, you have to keep some moisture in there. Why? Because these collagen fibers type ones, they don't like to be overdried. Eventually, if you overdry, they're going to collapse. If they collapse, you don't have a proper adhesion. So the adhesive system, the liquid that you're applying, is not going to fully penetrate in those areas. So let's say that I'm blowing my hair like crazy. I forgot about the deep care of my dentin. This is what is going to happen, okay? Water is going to be evaporated, and the collagen fibers are going to, there we go, here's the, the illustration. And the collagen fibers are going to collapse. Thinking of that, that the adhesive systems nowadays, they come together with some sort of like water um, <coughs> protection or extra technology protection for this uh, effect. So, uh, so when you apply this adhesive system, eventually they're going to bring back the collagen fibers into the right position. And this is actually going to benefit the adhesion and improve the penetration of the degrees into the dentin tubes. So again, the basic recipe is removing adhesive, removing phosphoric acid, I'm sorry. You have to overdry enamel, but at the same time protect the dentin against overdrying. This is going to be the best scenario for you to apply the adhesive system. Water, acetone, and alcohol, these are the, the three main um, substances they use, the chemical uh, things they use to keep the moisture uh, on the denting surface. When you apply the adhesive system, they're going to, the adhesive itself is going to penetrate into the denting tubes, and they're going to light cure the surface. By doing that, you're actually sealing everything. Question for you. Why do we need to seal dentin tubules by doing a restoration, either a mouth or a mouth? What's the big deal? Any ideas? The bacteria can get in. Again? Maybe the bacteria can get in. Yeah, it might be a, you know, what else? Sensitivity? inside the dentin tubes. I just mentioned that dentin is a living tissue, right? <coughs> well, well, actually, I'm spending time talking about dentin, liners and bases that I'm sure you're going to learn more about that. And that is it. Our goal as a dentist is to seal all the dentin tubes. Is to provide some sort of medication for that area. Why? Because inside the dentin tubes, we have extensions coming from the pulp. I also have water. Water and any restorative materials, they don't talk to each other. They're enemies. Okay? Plus, we have the toxicity coming from any restorative material. Any chemical stuff that you put inside of you. So they go in and say like you have to seal dentin tubes or dentinal tubes. Number one is to avoid microleakage comes with bacteria, so in order to avoid contamination more inside those small little pine dentin tubes. Number two is also to provide a protection layer in between the tooth and the restorative material. The big problem with amalgam, that's why we're using nowadays adhesives with amalgam, is that amalgam is a metal. If you like barbecue, you know probably that you don't have to hold your hands you know, close to the barbecue, otherwise it's going to burn. Why? It's a metal. That's going to conduct a thermal, right? 
So, so the, the, the goal is to avoid when these amalgamas are in function, patients eventually are going to drink you know, hot liquids or hot food, and then actually the, the heat is going to be transferred into the tooth. By putting a layer of adhesive, this is a kind of like extra thermal protection in between the amalgam and the tooth. Moreover, if you can, we can think about a million things that why you're putting this stuff in between the tooth and the distorting the tooth. But what happens to a mouth after a number of years? <coughs> shrinkage? No. You like the expansion on shrinkage. Perish? You have some oxidation going on there, right? That oxidation can actually easily penetrate into the dengue tube. Suddenly, the patient comes back after 20 years, and the tooth is completely dark, and somehow it changes the shape. And these patients are asking to do some bleach and something to fix the, sh the shape or the color. You cannot fix that problem. Besides putting a veneer, right? Or putting something on the facial aspect of the tooth. So, by putting that single layer of adhesive, you're actually protecting the tooth against the sustaining of the oxidation to go into the same. Does that make sense? So they have a bunch of things, right? I'm not going to go over the whole thing here, but this is a completely different you know, topic. Okay, Dr. Asaf is going to you know, go deeper into that. If you can highlight a few you know, bullet points for you, it's like avoid sensitivity, avoid contamination, provide longevity for the restoration, protect the tooth against uh, staining, against uh, change of shape, Protect the truth against